So hello, you beautiful, beautiful people out there. So this is our first uh, online course in chemical reaction engineering. Um, I'm still learning how to produce these videos. Um, yes, today the topic is autocatalytic reaction and the Euler scheme. So we will talk about one special reaction and also about a numerical method how to how to get some results. So the overview of today's lecture will be um, the autocatalytic reaction. And here we know the, here we have an analytic solution. Um, I will show you how, how you can find this analytical solution. If you don't want to do it uh, analytical, then you can use a numerical scheme for it. And here we use the very simple one, the Euler scheme. And this Euler scheme we will use for the autocatalytic reaction. And I will show you afterwards in two more videos how you can implement it in MATLAB and Excel. Okay, let me see if my laser pointer is switched on. No, not now. Yeah, now I have this laser pointer. Okay, so maybe you remember autocatalytic reaction. What does it mean? So in an autocatalytic, oh yes, here you can see so the, the, the first trial on uh, recording this talk, uh, it wasn't working. So I talked for like 20 minutes uh, without the recorder on, very bad. So and here I, I already wrote something um, that we will need afterwards. Okay, so in an autocatalytic reaction, uh, component A1 is produced, but this component is mandatory for the reaction to happen. Um, so this means that for the reaction to take place you need A1 and you need A2 and in this reaction a second molecule of um, A1 is produced and um, A2 is gone and A3 is produced. So this is the gross reaction and if you look here you can see okay here I have one A1 here I have two I can say okay it's just A2 reacting to 1A1 and 1A3. But if you would just look like, uh, if you just would look at this reaction equation, then you could assume that this could be a reaction of first order or whatsoever. But you have to make sure that A1 is present and A2 is present. So this means the reaction rate is described by K times the concentration of component one and the concentration of component two. And I think you remember this. The problem is always, okay, if you want to solve it with the differential equation, um, then you have to make sure that everything is expressed in just one concentration. So you can write C2 as this here. Um, how can you see it? Okay, you see that um, A2 decreases and A1 is increasing. This means the difference in component two has to be the same as the difference in component one from um, start to the end of the reaction. And if you write it down and then do some uh, algebra about it, then you will find that C2 can be expressed with this. Okay, then you take this C2, put it in here, and then you can write it down. So the reaction rate is K times C1 times C2. And for C2, you put in this expression here, and then you know it. Okay, and this reaction rate, you can describe it as DC1 over DT. And this, so this is a positive, value because um, C1 is produced by this reaction. So C1 increases over time. That's why we have here a positive value. Okay, what can you do? You can see that you have here a differential equation. And so the intuitive step is that you do the separation of variables. Then for the right hand side, it's very easy. Here you can um, kind of integrate it. But for the left side, 
um, it's not that easy. Here I have to look up in the um, table of integrals. So there's like a book you can read uh, or you can look up all the integrals and you just have to compare these two equations and then you will see okay x is c1 so this is our variable then you have here a minus this means a is minus one and b is the expression here in the brackets the two start equate uh, the two, two start concentrations so this means a is minus one b is c20 plus c10 and then you have here the solution for the integral um, still with the integration constant and then you just have to put it in so minus 1 over b becomes minus 1 over the start concentrations then you have the ln the a is the minus the b is the bracket term here and the x is the c1 okay and then you have here still the um, integration constant so how to find the integration constant um, for this you just say okay I know my concentration at the starting point so you just said here you, you, you say okay the time should be zero or starting time and then you can insert here for c1 you can insert the start equation c1 zero and then if you do it then you will find okay this cancels to this and then you have only ln c20 over c10 and yes with this you can determine c then you put it in again and if you do all the math then afterwards you will find that this is the equation that you end up with okay and now you can ask yourself two questions so if you want to know the reaction time t for a given concentration c1 then you end up with this expression so here you end up okay let's say I want to have a concentration of my component one of like one kilomole per, cu per cubic meter um, then you put it in here and then you get the reaction time that is needed for it or if you say okay I want um, I want uh, the reaction to happen for a certain time let's say one hour or so then you just put in here one hour and then you will get the concentration at the end of this reaction time. Um, I think I didn't mention it but what we have here is an example for a batch reactor. So all this if you if you are playing around with this DC over DT um, with no incoming and outcoming um, fluid flows then it's always um, reaction taking place in a batch reactor. Okay so now we know um, these two equations. Um, but if you look at the reaction equation, then you will see that there are, it's not only C1, but it's also C2 and C3 that we are interested in. And this can be calculated by algebra, algebraic equations. So you just have to look at the stoichiometry and with this you can see okay that the change in uh, component one so this is uh, c1 is increasing this means this is a positive value c2 is decreasing this means this is also a positive value c3 is increasing also a positive value and you can see that the change in all components should be the same this is the case here um, since all the stoichiometric coefficients are um, one or minus one. So and with this you can easily calculate the concentration of component two. It's this and you can calculate the concentration of um, component three. So let's let's have a look how this looks like. Um, this is taken from my um, German slides from uh, CVT1. That's why um, the slides here or the the labeling of the axis is in German. But I think you can figure it out. It's not that complicated. So time and 
concentration even uh, t is missing here i see it right now so what i did is i kept the starting con uh, concentration of component 2 i kept constant at 2 kilomole per, cubi uh, per cubic meter the k value is constant 0 0.05 and c3 also starts always here with uh, zero concentration at the beginning and then i increase the start concentration of c1 so you can see here at the beginning the reaction rate is nearly zero it takes really really long for the reaction to speed up but then in the end it becomes faster and faster and component two is um, decreasing in concentration okay now let's increase the start concentration of c1 you can see that the reaction starts faster and here you can now recognize that we have like a limit and the limit is due to the fact that the concentration of C1 goes down to the zero. Then we increase it even further and then you will see that um, the reaction or the, the concentration plots look like this. So here I additionally put the reaction rate this is the red line and the values are given here. You can see that at the beginning um, we, have, uh, we, we have an intermediate value of the reaction rate. This is due to the fact that we have a high concentration in uh, C2, which is good, but we have a low concentration in C1, which is not so good for the reaction rate. At the end here you can see that the reaction rate goes to zero. Here we have a high, whoops, here we have a high concentration of um, component one, which is good, but we only have very little left of component two. And this means that our reaction rate is not that high anymore. And you can see that it goes through a maximum and the maximum of the reaction rate, this is the intersection of the two, um, of the two lines here. So the intersection of C1 and C2 if the concentrations are the same, this is the maximum reaction rate that you have here. Okay, this is the this is the analytical background for this autocatalytic reaction. So this is one possibility to to calculate the concentration profiles and reaction rates and so on. Okay, so if you are not if you don't want to do all this integration stuff here and this one and determine looking up in table of integrals and determination of the integration constant and so on then you could go for the Euler scheme so this means that you just use numerics um, to get same re or, or similar results and from my point of view the Euler scheme is the simplest way to solve a differential equation numerically and what you do here is that you say okay here you have the differential quotient and you transform it into yeah small real differences so here they are infinitesimally um, small these differences and here you have small differences so this is an approximation here um, that you can see dc over dt is the same as a small change in concentration over a small time step and now you have to relate this concentration change to our reaction rate and for component one the concentration is increasing this means that it's plus r and for r you can write k times c1 times c2 for c2 um, c2 is decreasing it is consumed this means um, you can you can um, correlate it with minus r and this is minus k times c1 times c2 so this is the idea behind all this that you can say okay somehow my my change in concentration is linked with the reaction rate and with a time step okay what's the what does the euler scheme look like you start at our t0 is 0 and you have a step size delta t so you first calculate your reaction rate at the starting time 
This can be done with k times c1 times c2 at the starting point. And if you compare it to the analytic solution here, I wrote for c1 at t0, I just wrote c10, so this is the same. So c1 at t0 is the same as c10. Okay, then if you go back here, so you just put this delta t, you put it here on the other side, or even for for c1, or also for c1, um, and then you can calculate your change in concentration at the first time. This is just the <coughs> reaction rate times the time step size. So for C1 it's positive value, for C2 it's a negative value. And then you say, okay, for my concentration at the next time step, so T1 is T0 plus delta T, T1, the concentration at T1 is just the start concentration plus the change in concentration. For C2 it's the same. Here we write a plus again since here you have the negative value that makes sure that your concentration for C1 is um, decreasing. And then you have a recursive procedure. If you have a time Tn then you calculate the reaction rate for this Tn then you can calculate a change in reaction for both C1 and C2 and then you know your concentration for the next time step Tn plus 1 is the old concentration plus the change in concentration. So and basically that's it. That's um, how the Euler scheme works. Um, what you can say in general, um, the smaller the time step size delta t, the smaller the error. If you have a, a time step size that is much too big, you will end up with crazy numbers. You can have like concentrations of 10 to the power of 200 or so. So you will immediately see that this is kind of um, nonsense. Then the procedure for C3 uh, in an autocatalytic reaction is the same as for component C1. You can just write delta C3 over delta T is plus R. So um, due to space limitations, I didn't put it on the slides here, but the only difference is that the start concentration, you don't use C10, but C30. But it's very straightforward and you can directly um, calculate it. Okay, so we will use this Euler scheme for the autocatalytic reaction just as an example. So here we know the analytical solution um, and we can compare our numerical solution with the exact solution. First I will show you the implementation in uh, MATLAB. I will also give you a short introduction how MATLAB works. It cannot be complete because uh, MATLAB is such a powerful tool. Um, and I can only show you my MATLAB skills so I'm not using a lot of clicking and so ever but I use the code instead. So most of you are familiar with Excel, so I will also show you how you can how it can be done in Excel. And I will give you both the files, so the MATLAB file and the Excel file, I will give you in the email, uh, email room. But I would strongly recommend you that you try to implement it on your own. I think this is good practice and yes. So programming skills are quite essential, I would say, so at least from my professional experience. And why did I uh, choose the, the autocatalytic reaction? So we will use something like a modified autolytic cata uh, catalytic reaction to, to do some uh, modeling of the coronavirus. So the coronavirus is the reason why we can't um, have lectures in a, yeah, in a, on a face-to-face -face basis. But um, we, I have to sit here at home and talk to my stupid laptop instead of you. So um, since Corona is the reason why we can't do a proper lecture, maybe we can use it at least as an example and do some Corona modeling. Maybe it's interesting for you. I'll, I, at least for me, it's quite interesting. And then afterwards, we will, we will go for the semi-batch reactor. Here we also have to use the, the Euler scheme. Okay, so now let's go for the 
tutorials um, with Excel and MATLAB. Thank you.